welcome everybody. It's amazing. We're it's actually on time. Eleven oh one. And and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Angelou from uh, UI Sh Chicago. And uh, she's, she'll tell us a little bit about robust learning. She's been thinking about robust learning as well as active learning. And her uh, dissertation research received a AAAI doctoral consortium uh, award. Um, and she actually has been previously an intern at, at, in, uh, at Microsoft. OK. Thank you, Miro, for the nice introduction. So hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Angie from University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, today we are going to talk about avoiding the pitfalls of active learning with robust predictors for covariant shift. So um, this is the roadmap. Uh, according to title, we are going to talk about active learning. So we are going to first recap some of the basics of active learning. I know people in this room may have been uh, uh, expert in this area, but I think it's good to uh, recap some of the basics. And then we are going to talk about the robust predictors for covariant shift and <coughs> how this is can be used to help um, active learning. So that's our shift path method, active learning method. And then um, after that, we're going to talk about how can we go beyond the pessimism there? Because I think best pessimism maybe is not a very good general word in daily life, but it helps in active learning. And how can we go beyond that? And then finally, we'll come to uh, the, my future research agenda. So in active learning, we want to answer this question, can the machine learn with fewer labeled examples if they can ask for the labels? Why this is important in machine learning? Because in many areas, um, the data may be abundant, but the labels could be scarce or uh, very expensive to obtain. So like in some natural language processing tasks, we need to hire people um, uh, in online uh, platforms to get the data labeled. And also in some uh, scientific research area, we need to find the very few domain experts to get the, la the reliable labels. And the one, I think one another reason is uh, for human beings, uh, it's for human beings, it's very, it's very natural to, uh, uh, to learn some things by asking the right questions. I'm not sure whether you have uh, played this game called Echinator. That is like you, you think about some uh, real or artificial figures uh, or uh, characters in your mind. And by asking several questions, it can, this guy can actually guess, the, uh, guess the who, who you are thinking about very accurately. And in most cases, it, it, he got it right. So asking the right question for human beings is, the, is, a, uh, is a very efficient way to, to learn, to, to help us learn more efficiently. Then can, he, uh, can the machine do that? So um, I'll show a very simple example of active learning when we just want to learn a linear uh, threshold in a one dimension uh, space. So the passive learning way is we have some label data as circles and plots, and then you chain a classifier and find the threshold in the middle. And in active learning, um, it's kind of different. So we have some, several, we have some, uh, we have some unlabeled pool. And then we act actively query the, uh, correct, uh, the, the, the useful labels we want. For example, we first figure out this is plus, and we may think out about, um, okay, maybe this side is more, is, is more plus, then what about other side? We'll query another uh, example, which is uh, is circle, and we think, okay, the thre linear threshold must be in, uh, in the middle of these two. And then by four labels versus 15 labels, we learn this very simple um, uh, linear threshold. So in this example, we, have, we can see a difference between um, this uh, active versus passive way of learning. So in passive way, you, the data, a word just give you a bunch of data and just change, classify on that. And in active learner, actually do this, um, query the labels from the word uh, uh, iteratively, and uh, get, query the labels and get response, and do this iteration by iteration and before you get a model from it. And, and depending on how we get the queries, there are basically three types of uh, main scenarios of active learning. One is um, membership query synthesis, and the other is uh, you can assume it's, uh, and the first way is actually just uh, you generate the, uh, from the input distribution, you generate, uh, synthesize the, um, the data. Um, and the, the second way is you assume the data comes in a stream-based way, then you just decide whether you, you query or, or discard this. This, this data or this query. And uh, the poor based active learning, which is our main focus today in, in this talk, is like you, you can first sample a big pool of unlabeled data 
and then select the best query from this um, pool of data and give this data to the label or the, or the oracle. So there are two components, which is the label set, and uh, then another is a pool, a pool of non-label set in this um, pool based uh, scenario. And every time you choose one, uh, the, uh, the, you choose one uh, label, one, one data to label in this pool, and set uh, get it to the label set. And then you learn label, apply that to the pool, and you have some criteria usually um, to select the most useful, the most useful data set, a uh, data point from the from this pool. And the pitfall uh, exists, it's like as Satos uh, mentioned in his book in 2010, that the random sampling may be more advisable than taking one's chance on active learning with an inappropriate learning model. And why this could happen, so I'll give you an example. So let's say we have this 2D dimensional uh, space, you ha we have some labeled data as um, we, assume, we first assume they are, we do not know the label, but actually the labels are revealed. So they are plus and, uh, and the stars. And then we, our recipe of active learning now is we train logic regression from the label set and add that to add the most uncertain data point to the label set and, do the, and repeat. And uh, after 10 iterations, uh, this is what we get. Uh, we can see that the, the white circles are the label and are, are the queries. And which is we know, uh, which is we know the, the labels for uh, for that in label set, and we are only restricted in this lower um, left um, bottom, and uh, we also get a a very inc a very wrong decision boundary. And uh, the the color actually is the um, conditional dis distribution p plus given the the x or given the data. So it actually, except for that one, it actually classified everything as as plus. And why this is happening? So there are two um, things kind of contradict with each other in this poor based active learning process. One is when we um, train logic regression and apply that to the pool, we assume it, uh, the, the label data is ID with the, this pool. But when we um, pre uh, when we uh, label the uh, un uh, most uncertain data point and put that in label set, we actually produce something um, non ID because we are now random sampling. So Eventually, you are continuously biasing your label set. So in this example, even though we get a very good performance in this just label set, because actually this, this uh, star is, is a noise. We, you, got very, uh, you got very unfortunate to get a noise, then you just have this wrong decision boundary, even though it's very good performance on the label set. In this other uh, larger space, uh, you get a very wrong and very, very, very certain um, predictions because it's all red, so it's all uh, very certainly uh, predicted as, uh, as as plus. And in order to cor correct this wrong decision boundary, you may need to label all the points in the middle because every time you you you, um, you find the most uncertain one and which is the one that clo close to the decision boundary, so eventually you get something uh, star here. You may you, you may uh, crack this wrong decision boundary. Otherwise, you need to just continually label all the, all the things in the, in, the, in between this um, this space and get to explore the um, larger space when you get some at least some uh, star labels. This can cause um, both um, inefficient in active learning, inefficiency in learning uh, in active learning, and also um, bad performance in test set. Sure. Yeah, I, I didn't include animation here, but uh, I would say um, the first two are this, this two. After it figure out this two and this something, uh, some decision boundary in between, they start to um, collect the, the, the points, just the ones that are very close, just closest to the to decision boundary here. Yeah. Has this thing been seen in practice? Um, I think. People have seen this when your data is a little bit noisy, then you're very um, uh, easy to suffer from this, this sample bias in, in, uh, or the current shift between the label and the, and the pool, uh, especially when the data is a little bit noisy. Like this is, is a little bit, like 5% of noisy um, in noisy labels in, the, in this example. Yeah. 
So instead of putting this label and pool in two sides, I think it's more accurate to put them in this way. So the label set actually is a portion in the, in the pool of data. And if we th every time we, we, we put the most useful points in this set, and if we think this as source and target, like in domain adaptation or, or transfer learning, uh, we'll, we'll find these two holes. One is, um, so um, the, in the, the input distribution um, is different between this source, uh, this labeled, or, and this unlabeled pool. And uh, however, this, um, since we are, we're eventually we'll we're learn the true uh, um, conditional label distribution, um, this, this conditional label distribution between these two are still the, uh, the same. I mean, the, um, eventually, this will, uh, after you add all the data into the label set, yeah, you'll get, you're, you're still on chain as the same as the passive learning, right? But so, so at this case, the conditional label distribution still uh, are the same between these two. People have tried to, try things to, um, um, try things to solve this problem, this sample bias. One perspective is to adding more randomness. So instead of starting with just one data point, you can start with uh, maybe a 20 or, or, or some, some number of random samples in, in, the, in the pool, not just one. The other thing is you can, uh, every time you query things, you can restrict to a small uh, random subset of the, of the pool. Or you can do banded method that sample from different strategies, not just every time the most uncertain one, the one that's closer to the stream boundary, you can do other strategies. Or you can also uh, convert the pool to a stream and uh, leading to also more randomness here. But I would say that um, this kind of contradicts with our original uh, non-randomization um, perspective of active learning. Because eventually we want something to, that every time you, you add mo most, most um, useful data point, but get, uh, but get using fewer labels um, to learn uh, at the same as passive learning. So another perspective is um, uh, informative uh, versus representative. So usually by, uh, by uns the most uncertain um, um, data, you think those data are more informative, like the ones closer to the zero boundary is more informative. But those the point, if you only query those, they, they cannot be um, very uh, representative of the whole space in the uh, pool, in the, in the unlabeled pool. So people have used uh, combining uh, density uh, related or other representativeness related me measures in the strategies. So combine two or, or several um, strategies uh, to overcome this problem. But still, this, hor this, hor this heuristics to combine different strategies uh, lack principal reasoning and, and also guarantees. So uh, we have shown that yes, we can do um, um, we can do active learning to use fewer label examples. So if the machine asks questions, ask, ask labels, they can we can do active learning. Have show some successful examples, but um, not always. We also we suffer from this Korean shift problem. So can we avoid this pitfall um, by dealing with this Korean shift directly? So before, the, before uh, going deeper to this uh, topic, uh, I want to get an overview of uh, Korean shift um, problems in general in machine learning. So it happens a lot in, in reality that the training samples does not, do not represent the testing distribution. And uh, when only the input distribution or the covariance shift between training or testing or here source and target, then uh, it's called covariance shift. And outside of active learning, this is actually a, a research, uh, a already researched area. Like um, it's related with sample selection bias. Some of the data is just easier to be included or um, ha have higher probability to get included in your training set. Or some of the data is just missing or very hard to obtain. Or even because uh, some social or political reasons, uh, some of the data is ha appear more than the other data. And also I want to mention, this is not quite the same as the recently uh, maybe very popular um, internal current shift or batch norm sense of uh, current shift. So I'm happy that Ali mentioned in his talk that, um, so this current shift here we mentioned is more like between source and target, and we, uh, we want to learn from, from a biased uh, training data in input, as in input distribution and, and also predict well in the test distribution but not the, like the 
the kind of internal crunch of between layers in deep learning. So if people, a newcomer to, to deep learning or machine learning will get more familiar with this covariance shift than the, the traditional classic covariance shift uh, we mentioned here. So, so um, the, the ERM perspective of uh, solving um, covariance shift is uh, using importance weighting. So like in ID case, we can do um, empirical risk minimization or just assume that the sample distribution represents uh, the population. And then under covariance shift, we can do uh, uh, importance weighting or, or importance re-weighting re or importance sampling. There are different names for this method. But the best way is just you give it a P target over P source weight to, uh, to your data or to your loss. And in this case, in the limit, you get an unbiased estimate. So basically, the, the source part actually cancel out in the limit. You'll just get a, the expected target loss in this case. But this method has its um, problems, well-known problems, uh, like high, high variance. And also, courts um, um, prove that only uh, when the second moment of this um, P target over P source ratio is, is bounded, you get uh, some limited guarantees. So uh, I have two examples to show that uh, importance weighting has its problem. These two examples are two uh, like uh, overlap the Gaussian, and then uh, the solid line is the source distribution, and the dashed line is target. And the numbers I show here is the ones that with like large weights or large uh, density uh, ratios. And you can see that you can uh, if you uh, there are only few points in this case have uh, relatively large uh, uh, weights. So that if you learn this way, you can be dominated just by these few points. And uh, um, also, it's, it could be essentially bad for uh, small sample size, small sample size. Yes? I understand why the training sets are different. Yeah. Why the test set distributions different? Uh, Sorry, this is actually two separate, two different sets. One is like, uh, source is like more um, in the middle and target is broader, and this is two tilted Gaussian. Yeah, it's two different, uh, two different uh, sets, sorry. So, um, so we'll talk about importance weighting. How about that, applying that to solve this uh, um, currency problems in active learning? So in this example, we, by, uh, we, have, uh, we want to compa uh, compare the uh, so-called optimistic active. So in optimistic, I mean, um, you, you assume your uh, classifier learned in your training set can um, just uh, easily extrapolate to your, to your uh, pool so that it includes the active standard or active weighted. So it's like, uh, this, is, this is, we use logic regression as the classifier and uh, uh, have a standard one and the related uh, logist, uh, logistic regression. And we want to compare with the black line is the passive, um, just uh, logistic regression. And in actually two o o out of the four data set, we can see that at the first 20 data point, um, the, uh, the passive one is actually way better than the um, optimistic active learning one. So instead of this taking this ERM perspective, we want to take a different perspective uh, of uh, uh, learning, which is adversarial estimation. This is actually, I believe, well known. So uh, we, we assume, in this case, we assume we have two players playing a game. And uh, one is this P hat, which is estimator player, trying to um, minimize the loss. And uh, also we have this P check, which is the adversarial player trying to maximize it but under some constraints um, set by the sample data. So in ID case, and if the loss is the log loss, we actually, um, this, uh, this, is a quite, this is a quite famous uh, model. It will reduce to constraint maximum, uh, maximum uh, entropy. So by ID, we mean this, this loss is, is evaluated over the source distribution or training distribution. And also the, uh, the constraints of uh, p hat, which is the phi source, is, is also defined on the, on the dis, uh, training distribution. And this is equivalent with empirical uh, maximum likelihood and will lead to a uh, just regression uh, flavor of uh, predictor. So what if um, we use this under the, co uh, the covariance shift uh, perspective? How about 
have a, the last evaluation distribution is different with the, the constrained one. So we get this um, target eval uh, uh, distribution um, to evaluate this uh, log loss. But our constraints of the P check is still the, um, the source ones. Because we only, in this case, we, we assume we only have the label data from the chain distribution, but not the test distribution. And in this case, um, this will reduce the maximum en target entropy under source constraints. And uh, this is equivalent with the expected target loss um, minimization. So uh, using some tricks of uh, minimax and uh, Lagrangian multiplier, uh, this formulation is equivalent with this formulation. And if we solve this, um, we can get a parametric form like this, which is quite, in uh, quite interesting that it's similar with logistic regression, except that we have a ratio of p source over p target, which is the inverse of the uh, ratio in the importance weighting. And how this is different with the uh, importance weighting or uh, with the logistic regression? Uh, sure. Oh, what, 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 uh, so here, uh, uh, x is the is the input distribution, and y is the uh, the the label the label uh, uh, variable, and the phi is the set of um, the set of uh, constraints. Um, usually, it's some moment matching uh, constraints. Um, in the in, but but the, those are all, all, all based on the uh, source or training distribu distribution uh, constraints. I didn't uh, list the constraint here. Um, and that would be including the actively labeled points or not? That would be that we use in the label the source point, but not but we have no we well, assume we have no labels for target. So all the constraints are just the source distribution and the source labels. And well, if if it's an active learning case, all the constraints are just in the uh, upon on the label set. Yeah, little phi is the feature ve uh, vector that. So this uh, feature matching co uh, constraints is in that big phi uh, set. So that, that big phi is con uh, uh, construct this set that uh, there is some uh, feature uh, moment matching uh, constraints with uh, phi as the feature uh, function. And where does the covariance shift come in in all this? So, so the shift comes in the, you have different distributions uh, with the, uh, the loss evaluation versus the constraining the adversarial. So, um, so this is p-target uh, for the, for the uh, evaluation of the loss. But this is, that is a phi source, which means the, the, all the uh, feature moment constraints are on, only on the label set or the source set, source data. So it's actually we're, it's actually we're, di uh, we're minimizing directly the target loss over some source constraints. Yes? Um, so if you consider the binary case, where mm -hmm. it's just plus one, minus one, yes. is, this, is the weighting inside the X changing the decision or just the confidence? Um, is the weighting? Uh, it's just a change. It's just it's changing the confidence or the decision. Let me see. <laughs> I would say it mostly just changing the the, the, the confidence, the, the the certainty, the certainty. I'll show you an example later. So, any other questions regarding this formulation? Yeah, my bad. I didn't I didn't include the, the constraints. Uh, the show the constraint uh, uh, feature matching. Well, I just directly show the parametric form. But if you trust me, this uh, this parametric form is is correct when you have this target this as the target distribution while the the constraints under the chain distribution and because this covariance shift we have this py game x still the same between these two so that's the bridge so that we can do something like this we can use this training this uh, training set to constrain the target uh, or yeah the shear the py game x uh, predictor. Extended to general loss functions instead of log loss. Yes, I'll, I'll talk to that about that later. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, this is the uh, color map of the um, our RBA. We call that robust bias aware predictor, 
and the, the color map is still p plus given the given the uh, given x. So red is one and the blue is zero. And uh, this is a comparison between impulse weighting versus RBA. So uh, if you look at the and still this is the same over uh, tilted overlap the uh, uh, two Gaussian distribution. So in the impulse weighting case, uh, it's it's actually quite similar with the uh, logic regression case. So in the two corners, like the uh, left bottom column co uh, corner and the right upper corner, um, even uh, the, when this this ratio p source over p target is is quite small, um, they still get very. Oh, sorry. So in in our cases, when they get uh, they, they they get small, we actually they will jack the uncertainty to uh, very uni uh, to very uncertain. Um, to un almost uniform distribution, so we only get the uh, higher cer high certainties when the source support and over this target support is high, and when it's low, it's it's actually um, quite uncertain. And uh, regarding that, um, whether it changes the uh, decision or changes the, the, the confidence, mm -hmm. I would say in most cases it's just changing changes the uh, the confidence because. Um, if we do not have this kind of ratio, you can think about something as logic regression. You just have also red here and blue, blue there. Versus uh, impulse weighting uh, in those two um, places when you have no, even no data, you, uh, you, are, you are optimistic and extrapolate your uh, decisions um, to these two areas um, and be very confident and uh, cert certain that they are uh, plus and, uh, and circles. But we do not. Uh, do that. We kind of are more conservative and say, uh, and it's able to for us to say, I don't know, or I'm not sure in this in this area, and we only uh, have um, uh, high certainties in the in the w an area when this ratio is high, or when the source support is high. Any questions? So there are some properties of our, this predictor. One is the density ratio controls the certainties. And uh, also, um, since our objective cannot be evaluated it, because it's over the target distribution, um, we, where we do not have any label, uh, labels. Um, but the good thing is, the, even though the objective cannot be evaluated, the gradient is just in terms of uh, only training samples or source samples. So we can still evaluate the gradient and use gradient descent method to optimize the, the parameters. And also in this way, if we bound the gradient, we can get the bound in the uh, expected, the expected uh, test loss here. So let's try this out in active learning. So um, now the recipe looks like a little bit different. So we can first train RBA loss uh, minimizer um, from label data. And in this case, we do not assume ID. We deal with this current shift in this uh, robust uh, framework. right? And we directly minimize the, the target or test loss. And when we label the most uncertain point um, to, to the, and add that to the label set, we are not just considering the informative. Um, because in our cases, by the nature of our method, we um, you can also get very uncertain point when it is a little bit far away from your or, uh, label distribution or label data. So it can also query uh, some uh, representative uh, data point into the label set. So um, here comes the, uh, the same, exactly the same uh, uh, 2D space and same data uh, set we showed you before with the very bad uh, active, active learner. But now uh, we apply our uh, shift path metric uh, active learner. And after 10 iterations, this is how the um, predictive space look like. Still, um, the same thing, the call map is p um, uh, plus given this, this x. And we can see that we, when there is a label set of these circled ones, we have certainties around this. And uh, when there's no, like in that corner where there's no data, we still are stay, uh, we stay in, in uncertainty. Uh, How do we get the density ratios? How do we get density ratios? So uh, in this case, we use kernel, de kernel density estimation. So in, in um, practice, I'll talk about that later also, but in practice, there are different ways to, to get density ratios. You can also chain uh, just the discriminative learner, like logic regression, to get the ratios. But yeah, um, in our method, we will still assume that it's a, 
a component that you estimate before from data or it's already known uh, or you have abundant data to estimate from uh, for, uh, for our case. Yes, yes, we're using the unlabeled data. Yeah. So in this case, it's also, also similar with semi, kind of semi-supervised learning or semi-supervised domain adaptation method. The, 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 the framework is similar. Um, yeah, and in this case, uh, using the 10 data point, we roughly, we, we roughly learned the uh, decision boundary, in, uh, the, the right decision boundary here. And here I show an animation how this, we step by step, um, query the data. This is a slightly different uh, data set with the previous one, but it's, it's, we got a similar result. So, um, so the recipe now is like we train RBA and then we uh, get the most um, uncertain data point into that. So by the first one, and then we have kind of uh, this kind of um, space, uh, predictive space. We have certainties for, for those are po uh, positive, and, but also some uncertainties in other area. And then we, we query actually this one. And then something like that. And query the third one, which is the, the, at the bot, at kind of in, the, in, the, in this decision boundary, but something, something here. And the fourth one is also um, in kind of in the decision boundary. And at this case, still around the decision boundary, right? And the good thing is, it carries something at the top as the as star, and this, it makes a different move. And then this one, and this one, and this one. And finally, it figured out kind of the, the roughly the decision boundary, but also only have very restrictive uh, um, extrapolations of the of the learned model. And that's yeah, and that's it. That's the first 10 uh, data point um, we have labeled. And uh, you, within that, you can see that it's, it gives this uh, actor uh, some um, much, um, much more ability to explore the area when you include um, this uh, using this uh, robust predictor. So will the, sure. Will the line between bigger than a half and less than a half, will that always be a straight line? Um, the, uh, so again, the line between the bigger than half. So between bigger than a half or less than a half, will that always be a line, that boundary? You mean the decision boundary? Yeah. Oh, here, because we, we use just linear features. Uh, so we'll get, um, no, not, not always. Like if you use uh, different, uh, like high, high order features, it will, will get different decision boundaries. But still, because we have this rate, uh, density ratio in, the, in our predictor, so you always have some, like now it's not always lines, like also some tilted uh, 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 color map space. Are the features just the coordinates of the predictor? Yes. So here it's, it'll be a line, right? Yeah. So um, since here we use kernel density estimation, so the ratio comes from this kernel density. So it looks kind of looks like a Gaussian Gaussian uh, like kernel uh, some 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 also a Gaussian kernel. So you have this um, circle space in in the in in this. But the, the uh, main predictor is a linear uh, because the, the feature is just the, the coordinates here and uh, um, it's a, we'll change a linear um, predictor. But because the decision boundary actually also affected by the density ratio, and which is a Gaussian uh, density estimator here. So now it looks like, uh, like this, uh, you have circles and uh, these curves controls around this uh, the label, label data. I guess like mm -hmm. my, my question is like if the, so, so here clearly if I pick a threshold of 0 0.6, it's not a line, right? For logistic, uh, for, for logistic regression at every single threshold, it would be a line, right? So, 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 so what's a special, so I mean. I'm not sure I understand right, that like question. So, so here if I look at the threshold 0 0.8, right? Yeah. Uh, the threshold 0 0.8 does not correspond to a line, right? Uh, no, uh, I mean, I mean that when the yeah. if you um, 
you still point eight and get a yeah, curve. So, so I get a contour. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a contour. That's a contour. That's yeah, not exactly. a line. So, so yeah. similarly, if I did a contour for zero point five, it would not be a line. Yeah. Oh, I, I misunderstood. I, I thought this like that this kind of decision boundary is is, is the a true, line. The true underlying. Um, well, the true the true underlying one is a linear one, right? Because after you are adding all the data points to the label set, you will get something like uh, just uh, a linear uh, separator of the of this two, right? Because the the true one is just the uh, the true one is just uh, a linear one. But here, because we do not have uh, all the label data in the label set, we just have um, this using this RBA RBA method. So our uh, our decision boundary are uh, affected by this density ratios. So it's not a line. Is it a line? In in this in if you look at just the zero point eight or this zero six point is 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 not. But zero point five is a line. No, I, I would say zero point five is also not a line in this case. No, sorry, I, I missed on doing this line thing okay. and and the decision boundary thing. The, the true underlying one is is a line. Like uh, eventually, after all the things that are put that all all are labeled, then you will definitely recover the recover the true one. Yeah. So Angie, mm -hmm. um, do you have a theorem statement about when this is a good algorithm? Well, that's a very good question. So we are still working on that. Um, we uh, have some empirical observation that when um, not always like this method is favored, uh, and when uh, when the like in actual learning, when the number of points uh, you start with a very small number and the shift is large, usually you benefit a, a lot from being robust. But if you already have maybe a good coverage of the of the space, then probably you can just use the other method. So, what when this should be used, and what is the criteria or what is the condition on, uh, that we should use? We should be robust is actually, I think, a, a not solved uh, question and still open question now. And uh, I think people are uh, also thinking about because I know in there are several also research like uh, like a safe transfer learning because sometimes transfer learning can be even worse than just regard things as, as ID. And people are trying to be to make sure at least the transfer learning method beat the the, the ID case or not not just just. Blind, um, blindly apply a transfer learning method to, to some data set. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think people are still working on that. And for this, I would say, mm, I tend to believe that when the shift is large and when you're at the very beginning of actual learning, you, you should be more conservative and you benefit a lot from this robust method. Um, but, yeah, I think we need more rigorous thinking there. So okay, after this thing said it is that we try to look at the some at least the more real data set, but not that real. So like benchmark UCI data set. So uh, here we want to um, compare the, um, the the red one is the is our uh, proposed method, and our baselines are uh, in, include some of the method that only deals with this representativeness or the, using the density as the as the uh, strategy or the uh, the passive. Uh, robots are passively weighted, like the importance weighting one, um, and we can see that our uh, the red line, our method is um, at least better in in the. Um, I think this one is like it's better in the uh, uh, the second half, and all these others are uh, always better, and also we have uh, lower variance, uh, even in the in the beginning. So it's just to understand the graph. Yeah. Yes, this is the. You do things with a zero one loss, is that to give the same structure? I'll show the zero one loss. And then is, it, is this is this training set or test set? This is test, all test, uh, all, all, all withheld test data test set. The test okay. so, so log loss. When, and when you say number of data points is five, um, that means that only five labeled data points are used? So we look at the first 20 data points. So this, these are relatively small uh, data sets. So we just look at, even using the, uh, the first 20 data points, you can almost get uh, OK results. So, so in this case, we, all, in all these cases, we just look at the first 20 data point. Okay, so I'm asking, what is the definition of the x-axis? So the x-axis is the number of data points you include in your label set. Yeah, and the y-axis is the test log loss. Sorry about that. Test log loss. Okay, but do you get the same kind of 
qualitative structure when you do test um, uh, classification? Yes. So uh, this is shows the uh, classification uh, accuracy. Uh, actually, it's the it's the it's the one minus to accuracy. So it's the the error, the zero one error, and uh, on the same for data set. And uh, we are, we even have more. Uh, I think we this is include is I think more baselines than the previous one. I think. Yeah. So um, we have our proposed method, and our method just use the density, and also the passive robust and the passive. Importance weighting passes standard distribution and also the active, um, like the optimistic ones, uh, active weighted and active uh, logic regression. So um, this one is kind of mixed, but in, in, in this three, um, the, our accuracy is also much better than. How, than how are confidence intervals computed here? How the intervals? Yeah. So we have uh, 30 or 40 uh, different random start. So we always start from one. So then we do different uh, multiple times of a random start. It's the randomization over the random one nature. Yeah, yeah, the one, the initial one. Okay. But it's the same test standard? Uh, is it the same test standard? Yes, it's the same test standard every time. Same yeah. test standard, it's the same unlabeled data set every time, too. Right. It's just random over the initial, the initial point. Do you experiment with bigger data sets? Um, that's a good question. So um, we, uh, <coughs> let me see. We we've tried uh, we've tried this with like like uh, like and uh, add more data sets and it's almost it's almost similar and did not almost converge so we didn't uh, add more data set and I think we we've tried like larger data set and have more um, but um, I think the problem is when you have larger data set you have high, also high dimensional of features and uh, that gives us some challenges in the density ratio estimation. When you have high dimensionals, um, it's quite extensive to the, to the difference in certain uh, dimensions of the features. So it's, it's easy to get too optimistic, uh, or too pessimistic uh, in the density ratio. So um, I think, um, yeah, we'll get, uh, also get problems there when you get, uh, have higher dimension and larger data sets. Yeah. So it's not necessarily like the number of data points, the dimensionality that, that, yeah. that matters. Yeah, dimensionality also matters in, in our method. And also in, in, in real data sets, um, also had, when it's high dimensional, kernel density estimation also have its um, uh, drawbacks. So we, we're using actually, uh, if we use logic regression, then so certain times you need to estimate a few uh, label set and with a large um, pool of uh, unlabel set. And it's hard to accurately uh, get the, the density ratio estimates. So we, we also have uh, um, problems there. So um, I would say in, it, this, this is quite preliminary result. And we are trying to, after we figure out how do we, how do, we do the robust method, and then we can figure out how do we um, apply that, again, back to active learning to deal with, to scale things up. Because in, uh, some of the um, problems may just uh, e uh, exist in the, in the robust RBA method itself. So uh, to summarize a little bit, so we, uh, we, we can answer this question, yes, uh, when we deal with this quantum shift correctly or in a uh, reasonable way like uh, shift pessimistic. Here we uh, be pass by being pessimistic, we mean we uh, are not uh, optimistically think uh, everything you learn from the labels that can extrapolate or can generalize to the larger uh, uh, unlabeled distribution or unlabeled data set. So we pessimistic about the, the shifts. So how, uh, how do we go beyond that? So that, go back to that question. How can we improve over our RBA? So uh, RBA is quite a uh, pessimistic perspective. Like in this also example, this source is in the middle and uh, we just only have uncertainties in the middle and we do not, we do not extrapolate or do not generalize um, a lot to the space when, the, uh, when this ratio is small, like when there's no uh, enough uh, source data. So it is not always a favored um, when your goal is just to up, uh, obtain some good performance. So uh, what affects this uh, generalization here? Like uh, in similar as ID case, cases, um, um, regularization or uh, other stopping in the optimization or feature selection, feature engineering. I, I, I know in 
many of the uh, also in many of the transfer learning work, people try to uh, find the share the feature map between these two uh, distributions. So um, all this affects generalization. And in our method, uniquely, we have this uh, densities comes into play. So so in this example, like this this point is very far away from the chaining. And uh, even though maybe we, was, we, we have some domain knowledge and say, OK, the learned model can generalize. The den this density will not let you do that. So how do we get to reasonable generalizations? First, uh, we, we try to enforce stronger constraints to, to, the, uh, uh, to the training set. For example, in this, uh, for, in, for, uh, for this linear features, you can see that in the, in the middle when these two uh, overlapped, uh, this, uh, the constraints maybe on the moment match constraints not strong enough to have certain uh, um, certain um, predictions in the middle, but in the kernel uh, kernelized um, case, it uh, predicts better and and generalize a little bit more. And also, we can do something to the densities. Um, so in this case, we um, think that certain views of the or certain f dimensions of the features could be uh, closer to, um, to from uh, closer between training and testing or source and target, so that we should maybe generalize more on them. So in this case, we can deal with uh, some multi-view data. And uh, this example shows that uh, if this small circle is a source and the larger one is a target, this dimension is definitely closer um, between training and, and test. Um, then this dimension. So whether we can use different density ratio estimation, like separately for this, some of the dimension, like in this case is the um, vertical dimension. So, so does your min-max problem look like you're getting a max over views, or how are you? No, this is still it's still the same min-max problem. It's just we have different constraints. So we have constraints on maybe the 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 uh, joint distribution of x, and maybe you have another constraints on the that on that view. Uh, yes, yes. So, 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 you, so you still have the unknown target. Still, it's just, it's still. Just, so, so, this is about the, so then you have a union of constraints. Or yeah, yeah, things. yeah. We have s s several set of constraints so that you'll get a kind of a longer form there. Yeah. So, and the good thing is also we figure out a, a more general form of a, a robust method. So instead of p-source, we have a p-generalization and if the generalization distribution can be manipulated by, by, by us and, and applying its corresponding feature constraints, this uh, form actually will result in different uh, uh, predictors. And uh, the two extreme is if you are being uh, very aggressive and say all of the uh, learning after some reweighting, it should be uh, just generalized to the target directly, then you'll get impulse weighting when the generalization distribution is the target. And uh, if we're being very just conservative and say, OK, we do not want to, uh, we just uh, strict look at this uh, source distribution. And this generalization is just this current source distribution when you have data, then this will just be the very um, conservative extreme, which is the RBA we mentioned before. And then I, uh, I would say the thing is, I think in most cases, we maybe need to find something reasonable uh, in between these two extremes. So finding a uh, reasonable uh, region to generalize your, um, your uh, source predictor, I think, uh, lies in the heart in uh, building robust predictors. Because being by robust, we do not want to be too, to be too safe or too robust to be, to not, to be not useful, right? So we still want, to be, want it to be useful, but it can be robust in the worst case, have very strong uh, worst case guarantees also. So what about other loss functions uh, regarding your question? So uh, in the last few years, um, my colleagues and I are also working on other uh, loss, losses. So we are able to uh, generalize this uh, adversarial estimation uh, on uh, cost-sensitive loss um, and classification loss, Hamming loss in, in structural prediction, and also multi-variant uh, performance measures. And uh, I would say this is a good bridge or good start point for looking at different covariance shift um, met uh, method. So we can, uh, in this, in my previous work, I mostly w um, work on just log loss in the, in the covariance shift case because you actually just uh, get penalized more if you are very certain about some wrong prediction in log loss. Log loss will pen penalize you a lot. 
but maybe not that much in, diff in the dis diff different uh, performance measures. But it is possible to start from this and do our do the uh, more general covariance shift method as well. So uh, with that, I'll come to uh, my future research agenda. So in this talk, previously we, we, we uh, mentioned that this conservativeness, conservativeness helps, um, right? Um, and by being, ro being more robust, uh, we have uh, better performance in active learning, and also we have uh, a, a robust um, predictor for current shift. So I think in other cases, when the data um, does not represent the population, and we cannot even afford the mistake. Um, in, this, in those areas, uh, this method can be, can be useful, like in safety, critical areas, or in, even in fairness, or reducing the bias of uh, machine learning errors. When we do not maybe want to uh, stop and ask people for help and say, I don't know, before you maybe uh, predict something very wrong. And also in, some, in the areas where the predictions in the previous uh, steps will affect your data observation or uh, data um, collection process in the later step in this kind of sequential learning process, like in previous active learning. Your previous, um, met uh, ch previous chain model, previous policy will affect the, the data observations in the next step or affect the criteria you use to get the data into a label uh, data, data set. In those cases, being a little bit more conservative at the beginning may be useful to, for, uh, for you to better explore the area or to, um, to avoid some inefficient, inefficient learning. So one example of this is uh, in imitation learning, right? If you have um, a learned policy that is wrong at, at, at the uh, previous steps, then your um, space, state space you observe in, uh, will be quite different with the one the demonstrator or teacher uh, has, then it also has this uh, current shift. And whether it will be um, beneficial to apply some of the robust method there, it's, uh, it's also one of my uh, previous, uh, one of my future, future uh, direction I want to go. And also, um, how much conservatives we need. And uh, uh, as, as, as John's question, like under what conditions we want to apply robust method and how much generalization or conservatives we want to apply there. It's, I think, still requires more rigorous thinking. So yeah, I'm also very interested in uh, explore that area in, and get a theoretical, more theoretical analysis done. And uh, for um, another uh, perspective is, uh, I mostly work on classification. And, and, uh, but the active learning tasks are not um, just, uh, most of the uh, active learning tasks are not uh, active learning. Like many, it lies in, in structure prediction and uh, building or uh, building structures in data. So one of my current project I work on is trying to learn the pairwise um, um, relation between data nodes and using this adversarial, uh, adversarial estimator. And uh, that will produce actually uh, distribution over, probability distribution over cuts and which we can use to to uh, as the criteria, as some criteria like mutual information to compute the mutual information and do active learning on that. So this is uh, active learning over over um, stru structured data and over cuts is something I'm wo currently working on, and I think it's quite interesting because instead of like in ECRF uh, or the other things that you get a distribution, in this case, it's much more co uh, computationally efficient. So finally, um, I, I view broadly what I can, I can contribute or what I want to contribute in the future is that whether we can um, make our um, learner be more safer or robust and more collaborative in the future. Like by, being, by, by knowing the, some of the boundary or by knowing uh, the, the some, uh, uh, getting a balance between maybe the um, being uh, have good performance and robustness. Can our machine learner uh, know its boundary better and know when to, when to stop and then ask people, refer people for help so, so it make it more collaborative. And also I think when we want to build some of the principles into uh, our, um, into AI or machine learning like safety or fairness, these things, more, uh, more human input in the learning process may be helpful because you cannot just just um, put a bunch, uh, give the, the learner a bunch of data. 
instead of that, you can do um, you can have human to give the uh, the uh, the labels or give the even the um, the uh, desirable uh, features to the to a learner and teach it to be uh, to have those the, those principles we want them to have. So I think in general interactive learning, uh, I'm very interested in also in use that to do um, more um, more um, work in bu building principles to AI. And with that, I'll conclude my talk. And uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd love to take questions. Yeah.